this presentation is for new and old volunteers alike. You can take the old how you like. Um, <laughs> Both ways, I think. Both ways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there will be a short introduction to the site, just to remind everybody what it's all about, it, and its context in the wider landscape. Uh, the work we've done at Moystown so far, followed by what we're going to be doing this year. Okay? Right, so we'll start with Robert Kelly. As you can see, <laughs> he's right in the middle of Devon. Um, there's tons of archaeology in this area. From prehistory, there are Mesolithic, Neolithic flint scatters, Bronze Age and Iron Age hilltop enclosures. And of course, there's Romans just down the road in North Taunton. There's probably Romans here, but we haven't found them yet. <laughs> Um, it's also a Saxon stronghold. Uh, the Earl of Gloucester, Britrick, he had his seat in Winkley. Sorry, could you say that name again? Brit Rick. Right, no, so not Britvic. Not no. Britvic, no, that's what we know. <laughs> that was his called. brother. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the Doomsday, uh, Winkley <laughs> had a royal park for wild beasts. And there are Norman earthworks all around this area. In fact, they surround it. They're built in strategic places. They are generally intervisible and they guard river crossings. Then, of course, came all the civil wars, land enclosures and many other things that have shaped the landscape of this area. So where does Moystown fit into this? Well, Dr. Sylvia Warham, one of the landowners and a historian, very conveniently, has researched Moystown and found that there were a succession of wealthy owners. Um, documentary evidence shows that Roger Moyes was owning land in Broad Kelly in 1301. Also later, Roger Moyes was a Justice of the Peace, which is um, sort of a magistrate, but with um, powers to hang people and put them in the pillory and all sorts of other bits and pieces too. They were very powerful people. Um, Moyes Town obviously was owned by Roger Moyes because it's named after him. Whether he lived there or not, we don't know. Uh, Roger Moyes was also given land by the king adjacent to Oakhampton Castle. And here is one of his descendants. This is Richard Moyes. Um, can you see the photographs okay? No. They're, They're all right. a bit pale. They're a bit pale, yeah. But, uh, Oh, well, never mind. I think it's coming in through behind. Um, yeah. It's just too hot, no, really, I mean, isn't it? To uh... Anyway, this, this chap here <laughs> is Richard Moyes. Funnily enough, he's also in the legal profession um, and he is a direct descendant of Roger Moyes. He's standing here amongst the earthworks, if you can see those. The holding of Moyes Town was originally very large and probably of quite high status. There is a man-made scar which they dug into the hill to level out the whole site sorry, um, so that they could have level enough ground to build on which represents not a lot of man hours so it wasn't just a peasant's hovel they were constructed here in originally. But by the 19th century, the estate had been divided into parcels of and parcels of land were sold off and it fell into rack and ruin, really. Um, that was in the 19th century. The tithe map was produced then in 1839. Here you can see there's still quite a substantial amount of buildings standing. Here you have a courtyarded uh, set of buildings. The, and the hatched ones are agricultural. There's two barns there. This is all agricultural. The pink bit is domestic. So it's a pretty sizable house. Now then, um, 50 years later, in the first edition of the Ordnance Survey, it's already started to come down. One of the barns is missing and the wing of one of the house there has gone. It looks like it's been turned into just a, a boundary wall. Do you remember the wing bit mm. on the side that? Okay. 16 years later, the second edition of the Ordnance Survey records quite a bit of demolition has taken place. 
part of the domestic bit <coughs> and some of the agricultural buildings have come down. Um, this bit here is possibly in a ruinous state or not being used. These buildings with hatched roofs are were still standing. That's 1905. On the 1901 census, no one was recorded to be living at Moystown. And on the 1944 Ordnance Survey map and the 1946 REF aerial photographs, two buildings were still standing, which was this one here and this one here. That, that bit there had gone. The other buildings that you can see, the ones that with hatched roofs, were demolished sometime during the 1970s. <coughs> in 2008, Ace were invited to Moystown by the Warren family to give an earthwork survey training session to the Broadwood Kelly History Group, which we did. Offset and plane table survey. Um, so here we are doing a little bit of survey training in the hollow way where we started. It was, that was the clearest place to start. It's such a beautiful lane. Here we're doing a little bit of offset. Um, and we worked down to the end of the hollow way where you could see a lot of earthworks covered in a lot of scrub. So we cleared the scrub. There you can see tons of scrub. And there we are a little while later surveying it. Plain table this time. And you can see the hollow way just up there if you can see that okay it took quite a long time to finish the survey as it's a very large site and we finished it in 2012 four years after we started um, the earthwork survey revealed a massive amount going on here um, you can see where the range of buildings once stood that was a wing and that turned into the wall the main house comes down here and goes there. The house comes down here and goes there. And there's the building, the square agricultural building that you can see still looks quite good. You can actually see where the walls were. Um, we've got a little carp pond down here and um, a pit here. And this piece here is confused the whole site because during the intervening years, or maybe even when the place was dem demolished, uh, a whole load of building material, footings and things from local building sites were dumped. Um, just there, you can see a little bit of hedge. That's all that's left of the old um, the hedge line. And if we go to the next slide, where our earthwork survey is overlaying the first edition ordnance survey, you can see the range of buildings here and that's where the barns were and their carp pond is marked in the right place too there's a lovely stone cut culvert going through the bank here to drain it so it never gets too high it's really lovely um, <coughs> and that's all i need to do yeah what do we do next well we know we've got our earthworks we've seen above the ground what we need to do next is look below it so time for geophysics um, we started with dowsing which i certainly reckon is a method of very good geophysics um, we look for walls they were pegged out and uh, surveyed in as you would do normally um, this was followed very soon by some earth resistance um, Dr Penny Cunningham of Exeter University uh, came out and we spent the day, uh, well in fact several days didn't we, doing the whole side. Um, neither methods have proved to be very useful so far. Uh, the geophysics, the results from that, the demolition material just masked absolutely everything. And where it is showing a slight wall, um, it's out they're not in the right place cob which is of course made of clay um, clay is notorious for skewing results of earth resistance funnily enough does exactly the same for dowsing um, the, the dowsing we did actually find walls we could actually douse through the demolition layers but the walls are about 40 centimeters out so uh, 
the clay has skewed those results as well. So anyway, having done that, it was now time to write a project outline for excavation. And here we got a very pretty little, uh, <laughs> you'll have to believe me, that is a slide of sunset on the earthworks. Mm -hmm. you, you could look at that <coughs> and try and work out what it is while I <laughs> tell you what the aims of our excavation are. Basically, to record the site in its current condition as the area is threatened by farm vehicles which cross the site to adjacent fields. To verify the presence of any residual buildings as recorded on the Ordnance Survey and tithe maps and to inform future management plans of the site, providing some protection for any extant historical buildings. To assess any damage caused by vehicles and to help inform and create a management, future management strategies for the protection of the site and to make a qualitative assessment and comparison of the validity of dowsing and um, geophysics as archaeological research tools. Two trenches were initially proposed, these being 10 by 2 metres, just the two. Trench 1 would define, this there it is, would define the nature of the settlement scarp, establishing the character of its construction, whether it represents a single or multi-phase episode with subsequent recutting. <coughs> and trench 2 will transect the position of the buildings shown on the tithe map and ordnance survey maps and assess potential damage from larger farm machinery. It will also examine areas of interest flagged up on the dowsing and geophysical surveys, both determining whether there is any correlation between these methods and informing future research. So not much then. We started digging in 2013 for two weeks in August. First of all, we did a contour survey of the two trenches, took the turf off, then troweled down. No picks or mattocks were used at this point and all finds were three-dimensionally recorded. Trench one on the scarp. Here's a lovely sunny day. Just after we'd done this, you can see it's on quite a slope. We had heavy rainfall and it started washing the archaeology down to the bottom of the trench. So we, as we couldn't cover it with gazebos because it's on such a steep slope, we covered it out, we put the turf back very quickly to stop it eroding. Um, and since then, uh, there's been a, a new strategy of farm vehicle access, like none really. Um, so that trench wasn't quite so urgent. So we've left that and we still need to do that. Here's trench two. There we are, just uh, scraping away at the demolition material. And after two weeks, we've done that much. Um, we were taking it very carefully because we just didn't know what we were coming down onto. Since 2013, Trench 2 has expanded to include Trench 3 and 4 as well. So from 20 square metres, there are now 117 metres open, square metres open. And um, I'm not going to go into the detail, thank God I can hear you all say, <laughs> of the intervening years, other than to show you end of year photograph, just to show you how far we've got. Right, so that's 2013. This is the end of 2014. We've just about finished excavating trench two. In 2015, uh, we've extended uh, extension to trench two just here. And here we have trench three and another bit of trench three, trench three A, are just opened up. The year after 2016, we've not only dug all of trench three out, but we started trench four running up the hill and in 2017 we've got even further look at that we've extended trench two and three by a couple of meters so we could find out what was going on here and we've extended trench four right up another eight meters up to the top there and last year 2018 we extended down into the pit now even though you can't see the photographs too well just check out 2017 we had quite a dry summer that year but it wasn't too bad how green everything is look at last year <laughs> that is incredible total drought yeah we did so what have we found so far burnt mud, burnt mud yes <laughs> 
Here we go. This is this is the up to date um, simple plan overlaid on top of the ordnance survey. See, there's the range of buildings, and you can see what our trench, how far our trench has covered. Um, it's amazing it fits really really well i've not just plonked that on top it's actually tied she's in tweeted, honestly she's tweeted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just really good <laughs> right so now you can orientate yourself and see where the simple plan that's coming up next is just twisted round okay right now the gray bits are obviously walls um well maybe not obviously but they are uh these are uh made built from either cob and or stone and they vary the construction methods vary a great deal uh, we have three main thresholds that we've found so far <coughs> one here and you come right the way through the building and you can go out the back there there's another one just there and this one was discovered last year or the year before um, so right I'll take you for a little tour around the site we'll start with the exterior cobbles here um, up here there would have been cobbles there but it's just bedrock now I think the machinery that was used in the 70s to demolish the place has done quite a bit of damage unless they were taken away for another purpose um, so we'll start with the courtyard cobbles can you see them running up there you can't see up there too well um, but that's the bedrock up there and this is all the exterior cobbles I presume the rest of the courtyard is like this um, You've got to step down here into whether this was a covered building or not, I'm not sure, but this is an agricultural area. There's a wall and here's our threshold just here. There was a granite stone here, but we found just bits of it left. It had been rubbed out and the threshold into a passageway just here and uh, another room here in the parlour. Um, I shall go into that in more detail details we're moving in indoors here we go here's the passageway these cobbles uh, are local stone apart from the odd bit of granite um, and they're much finer than the local stone exterior cobbles there's our threshold and that's the exterior cobbles leading to the rear of the building um, there was a step here and a very wide doorway there's one door post and the other one looks as though it came out here so it's quite a wide doorway up into what we think is probably a parlour they were very fashionable in the 17th century as were these little tiny pretty cobbles that we have here um, also this is the internal wall that is a hearth um, <clears throat> right we'll go and have a little look at that here's the hearth um, and our pretty little cobbles now the cobbles, um, we've had a chat look at them and it's very interesting. They are very pretty, they're not local, they've been brought in. All the local stone is the uh, part of Bude formation, which sort of shillet and shales, that sort of thing. But our pretty little cobbles come from the Bow Breccia formation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I mean the nearest place they could have come from really is North Thornton. They are river, river washed by the look of it and they're, they're absolutely beautiful so it's quite a way okay it's North Taunton's not far now but in the 17th century that would have been hit, brought here by horse and cart so it represents spending a bit of money um, they the cobbles like this were very fashionable in the 17th century for well-to-do people they were showing off their wealth um, the half uh, probably was all <coughs> granite this is granite here and this bit here which you can't see the red but there's blotches of red which is burnt out granite they managed to burn their half out which is <laughs> incredible it has been repaired with some local stone which is a bit dodgy because it does tend to explode when it gets very hot and down here there are the remains of pretty cobbles on the side of the hearth um, so those those would have been put in probably the same time as this and when the hearth was constructed the hearth was, this part here was excavated down onto the um, bedding clays in which we found a piece of pottery which has been dated to the 15th, 16th century. So 
A 17th century parlour is probably what it is. Right, so we'll now go back to the simple pan briefly. So there's our parlour, you see, in lovely fireplace. Well, we're coming out here to look at the rear of the building. <laughs> First of all, oh yes, here's your exterior cobbles. The step there, threshold up to the top there. That's the back wall of the house. Go away, what you are. Um, you have cobbles, they run out here onto a stone path. There may be cobbles underneath this, we don't know. We haven't dug through it. Um, so we don't need to do that at the moment. Here you can see quite clearly a big post hole. But what you can't see over here, you have to believe me, there is another one. This one is a large, wide, dug post hole. It's got a lovely flat bottom and a nice stone in the bottom for the post to sit on. Um, and this one here is different. This has had a post driven into it. Um, we know by this, by the profile, it's got a little dip in the bottom and it had a piece of wood with a point on it in it. So just in case we <laughs> it was nice and obvious. If they're contemporary, it's probably a gate post. The gate would have been hung on this one and that one would have had the, the latch on it. Uh, there's a little field out the back here called nursery. Um, it could have been used for a cow with a calf or whatever. So you want to have a gate there to keep it out of your house. Um, and here we have uh, a workshop or outshot, but it looks like a workshop or uh, laundry. It's been used for several things. Um, here there's a, a little circular brick and stone structure, which I'll get onto in a minute. The floor is stone on compacted clay. It's a really good hard surface. It's covered in bits of coal and ashes. And over here there was found a broken sharpening wheel grinding wheel and lots of broken glass storage jars and bits of metal and a shovel waiting to be repaired and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, in the ash pit of this structure, because this is the ash pit here, we found um, hammer scale, uh, both spherical, which is a result of fire welding, and flat scale which is uh, from blacksmithing and um, which is odd because first of all I thought this must be a forge base then but it can't be it's far too low far too low to have the ash pit here it would be an awful working height until Wendy came along with a very clever suggestion it's actually a base of a copper um, is it Charlecott or Carlecott? Charlecott. Charlecott. Charlecott house has a laundry and this is a, a brick copper fire up fire up upper. in in this top bit there's a great big um, metal cauldrony thing and you set the fire underneath it and it heats the water for the laundry or in and it you see that the, you, you can't see because the light's not good enough but it has a curved front so you can get in and get the ash out as we have a curved front here. Mm. Whether ours had brick in it originally, we don't know. It's because it's been a bit trashed. Um, but it looks so similar. And here there's a piece of metal, and though it looks like the, you know, you set your fire on the top there. So it is far too low for a forge. So that would have been used for laundry. It could have been used for um, Water, hot water, whenever you need hot water, brewing, scalding a pig when you killed one, boiling your puddings, whatever. It could have, it would have been a very useful bit of kit. I find it a bit odd that they were um, mending tools and things at the same time. Perhaps they had different days when they did it because it would have been a bit messy, <laughs> especially if they're fire welding. Um, so anyway, that's really taken us, brought us to the end of um, trench two and three. Um, We'll now go on to trench four. We started on this lower section here, um, and I will show you what it looked like. Here's our pretty cobbles of the parlour. This is the the bulk of trench three, and so we're going up. We're still in the parlour. Um, this, believe it or not, 
is an external wall. There's nothing much left to show that it was apart from the exterior cobbles have, there are some edging stones along here. Those might be uh, wall base stones and there are some edging stones along here. And um, so that's our wall. Um, pretty cobbles sort of peter out, but return just up here, up against a wall running this way. And it's much higher up. There's about 40 centimetres jump up to the floor level here. Um, and there's a good stone base of a wall there. So the next year, you can see we're just extending the trench. Um, we'll now look at this bit just here. We got beaten earth floor in this room. Um, this is the wall I showed you just now. Uh, it has been pretty much trash, but this bit here is a beaten earth floor and then another wall separated separating this well I'm calling the niche at the moment because that's what it looked like it, it's probably just the corner of another room uh, we won't know until we extend um, there's the earth floor can you see that it's not overly clear too light but never mind it's made out of the same stuff as the leveling material uh, but with a few more ingredients and beaten down until you've got a really good hard wearing um, surface and the other wall comes in just up here and the niche here we go this was a lovely find quite late on <coughs> last year um, in situ plaster on its wall still you can see running along there it first appeared as a little crack in in the demolished cob and then it gradually opened out and there we were, bits of plaster. There's even backing plaster here. So they, they got the wall fairly level with backing plaster, which is old oh, mortar, lime mortar, lime plaster rather, sorry. It's um, lime plaster mixed up with a sort of cob mix. So it's good and sticky, but it does a, a good job filling and is a, lovely to put your smooth wall plaster on the top of. So. Um, that's that, it's very exciting, that bit. Um, so back to the simple plan, having done that, we're now going to look at room two, this area up here. Right, there's our bit of beaten earth floor, and oh God, I can't even see the niche now, it's sort of up here somewhere. Um, front wall of the house running across here here's the threshold okay so this was only knocked down in the 1970s but if there had been a nice granite step there that would have gone that was granite was still worth quite a bit of money in the 70s for uh, uh, putting in somebody else's house um, this is a porch wall here um, it's uh, mortared together with absolutely tons of mortar they they weren't short of it when they built that they even uh, rendered the outside with it whereas the house wall is bonded with a sort of cobby limey cob mixture so they were obviously built at a different time the porch was put on later it's not tied in at all just plonked on the front um, that wall is stone this one is mainly cob with a little bit of stone facing so just to make the doorway the portal um, we'll talk about these bits later this is the back wall and there are various bits of levels of flooring substrates here i we don't know what the original the, the last floor was because it's been somewhat damaged over the years um, but we we'll look at that in a little more detail the back wall on the northeast northwest side uh, there are quite a few courses of stone it's uh, the wall is in very good condition but as you see as you come across to the southeast side there's not a lot left of it they've uh, really had a good go at uh, with JCBs or whatever they used in those days here you can see the base of a wall this is the kind of um, what we call no foundations it's a uh, a sticky clay mix that's just flopped down and it makes wonderful glue for whatever you put on top of it either stone or more cob um, in this instance it's more cob there's cob up here 
you will see it's quite rough but that was really beautifully smooth um, there's a bit of mud plaster on the floor there but that may or may not be in situ right um, and that leads on quite neatly to oh yeah the fines we had tons of oh the blocked doorway sorry I'm going all over the place here aren't I when we first uncovered this we thought it was another wall but it looks now as we've dug down to the bedrock here um it's a blocked doorway this is stone with loads of mortar in it it's not tied into the facing stone at the end of this wall so it looks like the blocked doorway they've reconfigured the inside of the house at some point um, we had tons of finds out of room two I mean this really is what was left of and what people didn't want in the 70s they just left it and pulled the building down onto it um, this is just some of the many 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 finds we found this is a sickle and there's some strange bits of metalwork here uh, which look like uh, something to do with um, horse-drawn agricultural equipment because uh, there's stuff for uh, little turrets, turrets, are they turrets? Where the uh, rings and things go through. Rings, <laughs> rings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and over here, what could possibly be a barrel hoop or something. But there was there was lots of stuff out of here. Um, this is the slide that leads on neatly to the pit. You can see the back wall. You get a view of the top of it here. There really isn't. There's just the wall base and not a lot left of it at all here. And the pit goes down behind. There you go, the pit. Um, we know this was dug before Moist Town was demolished in the 70s because we've got a huge spread of roof tiles, a lot of demolished cob and a lot of roof tiles uh, with a stamp of Major and Sealy, which is a Bridgewater tile making and brick making company. Um, they, they were well, that name mid to late. 19th century so Moist Town did have a bit of money spent on it even in its late later stages um, right so that's as far as we've got dig wise um, we'll go on to fines the, these nice bit of eye candy here for you or dread if you <laughs> These are obviously not three-dimensionally plotted, otherwise you'd never be able to find their numbers. They're drying, they are fines bag, uh, fine stray fines. Um, each of these lumps of uh, uh, kitchen towel represents one bag and they are, there's so many found. Um, we stopped uh, 3Ding everything except for medieval pottery uh, from here. Uh, if, this is mostly industrial and uh, North Devonware, that sort of thing. Um, out of thousands of finds, only one, one piece of pottery came from a secure stratigraphy and that was the piece of 15th, 16th century pot found in the hearth. So what on earth can the rest tell us? A lot of archaeologists wouldn't even particularly bother with this lot, but it is giving us a huge amount of information. We have finds from Mesolithic flints. We have some beautiful blades. And right the way through, with one or two gaps, uh, to the uh, plastic and modern pieces in the upper demolition layers. So it tells us that people have been hereabouts for a long, long time, but then we know that. But looking a bit closer to home, uh, the finds are actually dating the demolition layers for us because conveniently the plastic age has left loads of stuff so the upper layers of demolition layer layers have plastic and modern things in and the lower layers don't which is really useful also it looks as though uh, they're dating our walls the construction period of our walls um, the demolition demolished cob from the trench 2 area which was funny enough the earlier demolition is a later building because in the cob there is very braided medieval pottery not loads of it but there is some and there it's uh it's so abraded it looks as though it was in the cob uh, when it was 
made and trodden in um, by bullocks or whatever they'd used that t in those days to make the cob uh, which is very very interesting because up at the top in the later <laughs> in the later demolished cob in the 70s it's very clean as far as I know there's not one piece of medieval pottery coming out of that cob so that could be certainly at our earlier building because there was no mess on the site to actually incorporate in your cob when you built it it's great just from a bunch of unstratified finds we found out a lot um, just to highlight it as well his um, north west facing section of trench two and three um, neatly shown a little post hole with a little pointy bit there where the point of the post went in which is rather nice it's slap up against this pillar or wall or it could be the heart of a, a Devon bank we don't know um, here you've got two layers this isn't demolition material as such this is um, leveling material this is the 1970s levelling material it's quite clean it hasn't got a lot of fines in it but this is where all the plastic and other modern materials have come from this covers most of the site this stuff <coughs> and as you can see it's very deep over here this layer is the site levelling material they used in the turn of the 19th 20th century and very interestingly at the moment I mean the finds have not been analysed properly yet and we tend to start on that this year but what we've been noting as it's been coming out is a lot of medieval pottery some of it quite early uh, is coming from the upper layer with a few bits of industrial wear and intervening years and down here there is very little medieval pottery and plenty of industrial so it looks like the material they used to level this bit in the uh, the early days they managed to incorporate a rubbish dump or midden and so when you're taking it off the top and scraping it over which is coming down here with very little medieval pottery and up here you're you're getting lower down in your midden where there is more medieval pottery so we have an inverted midden here which is very interesting and um, very close by here uh, we found a piece of Saxo-Norman pottery, it's a, a, a part of a spout of a water pitcher which is really interesting and, and we think we found one or two other pieces as well but that piece has been confirmed so that's really rather great. So this leads us on to what are we going to be doing this season. We shall go back to the simple plan overlaid on the Ordnance Survey map um, this is going to be trench five. Um, ideally, I would like to dig from here all the way down and take the whole lot out. Yeah, but that's going to depend on the weather and how many diggers we've got and whether we are exhausted or not. So getting a bit real about it, say it's going to rain a lot or it's going to be really sunny. We're going to need gazebos. We have enough gazebo coverage to cover this area. <coughs> this area will answer a lot of questions. Um, it will tell us what's happening to this wall here, how wide this wall is, if that is indeed a blocked doorway, and what happens here with this niche. Does this continue, this wall, or, or what? And do, what happens with this one? Also, we will find how far out this way our beaten earth floor comes. Uh, this wall here is there's hardly there's not really anything much left of it at all so we, we'll be able to if it's the same going across here we though that is close to the bog we will be able to dig that quite easily. Um, the main question this might I'm hoping is going to answer is if this is a longhouse this end here is down slope so this will be the buyer so what we're going to be looking for under all the recent domestic stuff is a central drain which should run that way. Uh, it'll either be cut into the bedrock or it will be above. Um, 
I'm hoping that the trashing in the 1970s is sufficient so that we can not feel too bad about going through any floors because they will be we are going to clean off what they left us and hopefully we'll find our drain of course we could extend this way which would be really great because we find out what's going on with this porch and the walls are in much better nick so we'd see where they were and what they look like but only in the 1970s so um and we'd find lots and lots of finds but the stuff they didn't want from the 1970s we will get to this side hopefully one day but this one is going to answer our questions so it's not too bad that's eight by uh, three meters and she's not too huge um, because apart from finishing the pit that's all we will be doing this year so it just leaves me to say I hope um, you will all join us in front of the tall tent for another daft photograph at the end of the setting up day and um and look forward to seeing you all there thank you right there will be a short interview